Hello, and welcome back to part 3. If it seems strange and you thought that this video was re-uploaded, well, it actually was, due to an issue with the video getting blocked. The easiest way to fix it was through making minor changes and re-uploading, so if you want to do me the favor of leaving a like on the video to help boost it back into the YouTube algorithm, that would be very much appreciated. The next part of our journey through the decade takes us to New York City, which itself became an interesting hub of family entertainment. If you visited the island of Manhattan in the 1880s, one of its more prominent locations was an intersection known for its horse coach production, dubbed as Longacre Square, named after Longacre in London, which was famous for the same thing. Originally home to William Henry Vanderbilt's American Horse Exchange, the square was created by the intersecting streets of 7th Avenue, 42nd Street, and Broadway, and the area was and continues to be known for its rich history of theater. As electricity was introduced to New York City, it opened the door for the Interborough Rapid Transit Company to open its first underground subway line in 1904, with a stop in Longacre Square, drawing a lot more people and businesses to the area through its easy access. During the construction of the subway, the New York Times commissioned a skyscraper at the intersection, which was the second highest in the city at the time, and opened in 1905 as their new headquarters. Seeing the significant potential for this area, the city renamed Longacre Square to Times Square the previous year, and it would continue to grow as a hub in the city, known for its theaters and entertainment. However, as the United States entered the Great Depression, the theater industry in New York struggled and new, cheap businesses moved in, introducing explicit and seedy films that tainted the reputation of this area. Throughout the 20th century, Times Square still maintained its theater industry and became an iconic symbol of American consumerism, but alongside this were a lot of disreputable businesses, adult entertainment, and a pretty significant rise in crime. New York City's own brightly lit den of sin really makes the Vegas Strip of the same era seem a lot more tame, and as it aged throughout the 70s and 80s, it only continued to get worse. However, since the 80s, an effort was made by the city to clear out Times Square and its main thoroughfare of 42nd Street of its unsavory businesses and patrons, and one of the ways that it planned to do this was by reviving its historic theaters, which had long been used for sleazy entertainment and had fallen into disrepair. One of the forces of change was the new 42nd Street, a non-profit organization that was created to revive the area, both economically and culturally. One of the key players in the organization was chairwoman Marion Heiskell, a member of the family that owned and operated the New York Times, where she served as director of the paper from 1963 through 1997. Another important member was Robert Stern, a New York City architect who was famous for designing quite the number of buildings in the city, as well as designing projects for Disney, such as the Yacht Club, the Beach Club, the Boardwalk, and even played a large part in the development of Celebration. He also served as a member of the board for Disney from 1992 through 2003, and along with Heiskell, who was a family friend of Michael Eisner, they were able to influence Disney into restoring the dilapidated New Amsterdam Theater for $8 million. Why? Well, as Disney animation limped on throughout the late 60s, the 70s, and into the 80s, it was revived when 1989's The Little Mermaid. What made this film different was the involvement of Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, notable writers for the 1982 musical Little Shop of Horrors. What they helped to do was develop the script in a format of a Broadway-style musical, and with clearly positive financial and critical reception, The Little Mermaid launched what is often called the Disney Renaissance, the slate of films released by the studio up through Tarzan in 1999. Their next major hit was Beauty and the Beast in 1991, and following the format of a musical as well, Disney developed the idea of actually adapting it into a live production, which they successfully did in 1994, premiering it at the Palace Theatre on Broadway. However, the plans for the new Amsterdam Theatre were finalized in 1995, and Disney began work to quickly restore it, signing a 49-year lease, and premiering their first production, an adaptation of The Lion King, in 1997. While Disney was not the first to work with New York City on acquiring a theater, they were certainly the most important catalyst in helping 42nd Street to become more family-friendly. As part of the agreement, Disney pressured the city to sign another deal with developer Bruce Ratner to build a complex that included a Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, as well as a 25-screen AMC movie theater, understanding that new developments appealing to tourists 
would help drive out the more unsavory businesses. From here, Times Square evolved into the beacon of American consumerism that it is today, with a mandate requiring buildings to have massive, flashy billboards that lit the area at night, and it introduced many businesses and restaurants that were familiar suburban comforts, but expanded on in the city to be more exciting. For example, 1995 saw the introduction of the Virgin Megastore, which was a larger-than-life consumer chain from the UK that specialized in selling music CDs. Right next door to their new theater, Disney also opened what was described as their flagship Disney Store location in 1996, a label that was often applied to the sizable themed stores that opened in Times Square. While not the first Disney Store location, it was certainly the largest and contained two floors of retail. In 2002, Hershey's Chocolate World opened, also known as their flagship store as well. Hershey's Chocolate World was based off of the original right outside of Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, which you might recall I've discussed in a video before, notable for its chocolate tour ride inside. Like the original, the Times Square location embraced a factory theme decorated with large props of Hershey products. Right across the street, the M&M store opened in 2006, which is just right outside of the time frame of the video, but I think it does fit the spirit of how Times Square was developing. Another notable flagship retail store was Toys R Us, which opened in 2001 with four separate floors. The store was notable for its many themed displays for prominent brands of toys, the most impressive of which included an animatronic Tyrannosaurus Rex for Jurassic Park. Also notable and iconic for the location was the Ferris wheel inside, a fun addition that contained individually themed cars featuring famous toy lines or movie characters. Times Square and the surrounding area was notable for introducing themed restaurants as well, which brings us briefly back to themed McDonald's. The actual Times Square location was a large building with two floors, decorated to celebrate New York City itself. It contained Broadway lights, and the walls were painted with scenes that showcased the iconography of the city. It does appear at one point that up on the second floor, there was a model of New York, which was made up of famous buildings and other landmarks such as the Brooklyn Bridge, the Statue of Liberty, the globe from the 1964 World's Fair, and the cyclone from Coney Island, among many others. Of course, this particular location had a great view looking out into Times Square itself and opened in 1998. However, another location opened on 42nd Street in 2003, which, while not as interesting, was more themed to Broadway with its massive marquee sign out front. Inside, while I wouldn't really call it themed, the multi-floor building was decorated with a lot of brickwork, which I believe was intended to evoke the idea that it was an old theater building, which makes sense in the theater district. Times Square was also home to other themed chain restaurants, including ESPN Zone, which opened in 1999, and Bubba Gump Shrimp Company in 2003. However, New York was known for other original themed restaurants during this era too, and one of its most unique was WWF New York. Opening in Times Square in 1999 in the old Paramount Theater building, the restaurant was themed to wrestling branded through the World Wrestling Federation, although following a lawsuit from the World Wildlife Fund, it was renamed to World Wrestling Entertainment in 2002. Subsequently, the restaurant was renamed to The World the same year as well. The appeal of the restaurant was that it was also a place where wrestling fans could view pay-per-view events, although from anecdotes I've read online, the place was apparently empty most other nights. The food was also notoriously terrible, although this reputation was offset with a nightclub, a WWE merchandise store, and an arcade to bring in some additional revenue. Ultimately, the world did not last very long and closed in 2003, but at least the idea of the establishment was interesting because of its novelty. Still, while it was technically themed to wrestling, the actual interior design was rather unremarkable, and if you wanted an experience that was more overtly themed, all you had to do was make a short walk over to Paramount Plaza. There you would find a recess that led to a courtyard below street level, which featured a mounted UFO to draw your attention. Looking around, you saw the sign for the establishment, Mars 2112, and as you entered inside, you would find yourself in a waiting area designed almost like a spaceport. Patrons to the restaurant then boarded one of two identical simulator attractions. Through a three-minute experience, riders would fly out of New York City in this simulated spaceship, 
using speed rings to get to the moon, and finally engaging with a device that opens up a time-traveling wormhole. Moving through, the ship passed through a few dramatic cosmic events in space before landing on Mars in the year 2112. Once lit up from the simulator, patrons moved through a small canyon and into the star bar, which served themed cocktails. Once ready to be seated, diners emerged out into the Crystal Crater, a three-story room that contains the majority of tables. The establishment was decorated with space-themed props that related to Mars, and looking up at the ceiling of the Crystal Crater, an LED light display simulated a fantastical night sky. While dining, roaming aliens would interact comedically with patrons, with some of the more notable characters including Empress Gloriana, the ruler of Mars, or an odd scientist known by the name of Dr. Mars. The restaurant opened in 1998, and like many other themed dining establishments of the time, was known for both its excessive theming, but also downright terrible food quality. That being said, it does appear that the presentation of the sci-fi food was at least creative, which is something that I don't think the world has ever really seen since, at least not until Disney started doing it with Satoli Canteen at Pandora in 2017. Still, for the tackiness of Mars 2112, it was very well themed, and thought was even put in to help patrons left the restaurant, sending them through a simulated teleportation slash time travel machine to get them back to Times Square. Another notable themed restaurant that emerged in New York City in the 90s was the Jekyll and Hyde Pub, which opened its first location on 7th Avenue in the West Village in 1991. What made this restaurant so remarkable was its eclectic horror theme, and if you know anything about the Adventures Club on Pleasure Island and Walt Disney World, then you'll see a lot of similarities here. It was a dining space filled with comedic animatronics that would banter with the guests and with live actors, and while quite small, was remarkably well-themed and entertaining. In early 1995, another much larger location would open on 6th Avenue just south of Central Park, known as the Jekyll and Hyde Club, and while it wasn't in Times Square, it was at least within reasonable walking distance and still accessible to tourists. This location was much larger, and once patrons entered the restaurant, they were put into a pre-show of sorts, where they were judged by spirits on their wickedness, and, failing the test, spikes began to descend from the ceiling, implying your demise. Once the lights flicker out, you are then invited in by ethereal voices. Once patrons stepped into the restaurant itself, they could be seated on any of the four floors, which, working from the bottom upwards, were called the Grand Salon, the Library, the Laboratory, and finally, the Attic. They overlooked a main stage where one of two shows would play, one of which was Dr. Jekyll coming out, warning them of danger, and then transforming into Mr. Hyde, aided by smoke and lighting effects to achieve this. The other show involved Dr. Frankenstein, who would lift a corpse on a table and provide a jolt of electricity, animating it into the famous monster. Guests to the Jekyll and Hyde Club interacted with a number of roaming characters, and animatronics on the walls would cycle through different bits. On the third floor, a control booth was able to access cameras and the animatronic figures on all levels, using a microphone to interact more personally with guests on any given floor. Also notable was the bathroom, which, if asked for, guests were vaguely directed to the library with no further details. The actual bathroom itself was hidden behind a trick bookcase, which would lead to comedic confusion, although in retrospect, I don't know how this wasn't illegal. Unfortunately, this location closed in 2012 It was moved to a smaller but still notably interesting location in Times Square the same year. While it falls way outside of the 90s scope of this video, at the very least it was a continuation of a very 90s idea, though it too unfortunately closed in 2015, followed by the original pub location in 2022. Also, a special thanks to Zach, a viewer of the channel, for helping me research this particular portion. I would also like to shout out Doors of Divergence, who he is in association with, which is an entertainment company that specializes in immersive narrative escape rooms. While not as thematically significant, I want to move away from the Jekyll and Hyde Club and briefly highlight Ellen's Stardust Diner, which is just north of Times Square. While it falls outside of the Times Square revival period as it opened in 1987, the diner is a 1950s themed establishment that did probably benefit a lot from it. Known for its singing waitstaff, Stardust Diner also contains products and artifacts from the 1950s, and while not the most interesting location to me, is at least worth a quick mention. 
Finally finishing out this segment on themed New York restaurants, another outlier I wanted to highlight is Ninja. What makes this different is that it opened in 2005, so it really stretches the 90s designation, but it was also located down on Hudson Street, which is pretty far south of Times Square, and so not fitting for the theme of this segment. Still, this ninja-themed restaurant that served vaguely Japanese dishes seemed like a fun time, where the waitstaff dressed like ninjas tried their best to startle you through dumb pranks. Here are your menus, sir. We've stabbed people accidentally, of course. We've caught people on fire. Are you a ninja? Uh, no, I'm a chef. Ninja is more of an honorary mention because it doesn't really fit anywhere, but this does bring the Times Square segment of the video to a close. While its establishments may not have been as overtly themed as the resorts on the Vegas Strip, in many ways it did feel like an East Coast counterpart as it pivoted towards family entertainment. Since we just spoke about Mars 2112, I think it's also worth mentioning that a second location opened in Woodfield Mall, which is located just right outside of Chicago, and is the largest mall in the state. This version of the restaurant was built inside a defunct Cineplex Theater, and operated briefly from October 2000 up through November of 2001, and closed from just simply not generating enough business. However, like its New York counterpart, it too began with a simulator that took you to Mars, it was otherwise pretty similar. However, the restaurant is not the focus of this segment, and is instead a good segue into shopping malls of the 90s. In the intro of the video, I did briefly show a photo of the food court from White Flint Mall in Bethesda, Maryland. Aesthetically, it's notable for its postmodern neon design that either came about in the late 80s or early to mid 90s, and photos of this location are often shared around online because it just captures the essence of the decade in such a nostalgic way. If this is what the food court looked like, then what about the rest of the mall? Well, it opened in 1977, and the design very much reflects that. There were certainly updates, but the core design philosophy of the mall was stuck in the 70s, which isn't really bad, but the food court evokes an idealized 90s that never really was. So what does an actual 90s mall look like? Well, in 1995, Seminole Town Center opened in Sanford, Florida, which is located just north of Orlando. Driving up to it, one of the first elements you'll notice is the abandoned Macy's building, adorned with sculpted palm structures that contrast with the pastel pink decorating the building. Once you enter inside, the main concourse is notable for its pastel green tile floor design, as well as false shutters up above contrasting with pink and white neon lights, and indicating a very 90s interpretation of a vague Florida or tropical theme. Reaching the center of the mall, a hanging sign advertising the food court is designed specifically with a Memphis aesthetic, and if you actually walk over to the food court itself, it's rather standard, except for the lightly themed husk of a pub in the middle, designed to be a pirate ship. Finally, while not much signage manages to still exist, you can still find a few examples throughout, again adapting a charming version of the Memphis aesthetic to nostalgic effect. While there are many design choices and touches here that are very 90s in nature, the mall isn't really that remarkable in any other way. Part of what makes the 90s so nostalgic and appealing is its consumer culture, and looking back, the idea of the neon-soaked shopping mall as this center of community and consumerism seems very appealing. The reality, though, is that while we like to imagine these places as enchanting postmodern spaces, a lot of the remnants we see were really just decorative accents that occasionally made an appearance. This isn't to say that there weren't any malls that weren't just screaming 90s aesthetics, though. When I asked for suggestions for 90s content on my community tab, a viewer who goes by the name of Bobby suggested I look into the Mills Corporation. While many of their malls from the early 90s are otherwise unremarkable, Many of the locations that they either built or acquired in the late 90s to early 2000s definitely have a unique, period-appropriate aesthetic. For example, St. Louis Mills, which opened in 2003, has a very distinct postmodern Y2K aesthetic throughout its concourses that is just absolutely fascinating. At the time of writing this, the mall is still open, though most of its stores are closed, so at the very least, this relic of the past is still around for the time being for anyone to experience. 
Another interesting mills location is the Forest Fair Mall in Cincinnati, which originally opened in 1988 and came from a mall developer known as Omega. In its original iteration, Forest Fair had a uniquely notable and colorful aesthetic of the era and even contained a few rides inside. However, after Mills acquired the mall in 2003, it was completely renovated into another notably colorful Y2K design, which is also just enchanting to behold. While many different areas of the mall are very visually distinct, there's something about the different shades of brown in the flooring and how they contrast with the shades of blue along the walls that feel like they distinctly define the aesthetics of the early aughts. Mill seemed to know the importance of keeping the rides in the center of the mall intact as well, which did seem to be a staple of many malls in this era too. However, while some malls had rides on a smaller scale, other malls were essentially ambitious indoor amusement parks. The West Edmonton Mall, opened in Alberta in 1981, is not only Canada's largest mall, but the largest in the world at the time. On opening, the mall was 1.1 million square feet in size and contained 220 stores, notable for its three anchor tenants with The Bay, Eaton's, and Sears. However, 1983 saw the opening of Phase 2, which not only expanded the mall to over twice the size it was previously, and added another remarkable quantity of 240 stores, but it also added a few attractions as well. This included the Ice Palace, a skating rink large enough to accommodate an NHL game, and was actually a practice space for the Edmonton Oilers up through the late 80s. More notable, however, at least to the theme of this video, was the addition of a large indoor amusement park known as Fantasyland. When it opened, the park itself was pretty standard for something aimed towards younger children, offering a small number of flat and tracked rides that weren't too intense. However, the mall quickly moved into a Phase 3, where in 1985, Fantasyland saw many additions, some of which were notably thrilling. This included Drop of Doom, an Intamin produced freefall tracked ride, as well as Mindbender, which was the largest indoor coaster in the world at the time. Manufactured by Schwarzkopf, Mindbender was notably intense for what would be perceived as a small coaster by today's standards, it was a major draw to Fantasyland, that is, until an accident in 1986, where the fourth car on one of the trains derailed as it was moving through the ride course, leading to the passing of three riders and major life-altering injuries to a fourth. It was ultimately deemed that Fantasyland was responsible for negligent training on how to perform proper maintenance on the attraction, and with headlines stating that a roller coaster had derailed in Fantasyland, Disney sued the park to change its name, which, after a long battle, they eventually succeeded in doing, and in 1995, the park was renamed to Galaxyland. Still, despite the horrible accident, Mindbender reopened in 1987 with new trains, and even with such a dangerous reputation, it still managed to continue on as a major reason to visit. In addition to its new rides in Fantasyland, 1985 also saw the introduction of the World Water Park, notable then for not just being indoors, but also for having the world's largest wave pool. In addition, many aquariums were added nearby, as well as a giant lagoon with a replica of Christopher Columbus's largest ship, the Santa Maria, circled by a submarine ride called the Deep Sea Adventure, which allowed visitors to view up to 200 different species of fish, and looked quite conceptually similar to what was in Disneyland and in the Magic Kingdom. Next to the lagoon was a large pool, where trainers would interact with and put on shows with bottlenose dolphins, which lasted in the mall up through 2004. Phase 3 also saw the addition of the world's largest indoor mini golf course, as well as new themed shopping and dining areas. Europa Boulevard was a bright, charming Parisian themed concourse that sat under a massive skylight, and in contrast, Bourbon Street was dark and enclosed, themed to the New Orleans French Quarter. In its first decade, the mall also saw many other additions to its concourses, which included elaborate fountain displays, statues, a kinetic sculpture, and even aviaries featuring birds like peacocks and parrots. Finally, in 1986, the last major expansion for the mall came with the Fantasyland Hotel, which opened with 354 rooms, 120 of which were notably decorated to represent a number of different eclectic themes, ranging from Hollywood to ancient Rome, to tropical Polynesia, to Victorian coaches, 
to the Sands Inn Palaces of Arabia, to a room themed to a pickup truck, and a room themed to a Canadian railway car, just to name a few. While the mall really came into its own in 1985 as an ultra-themed experience, its plans really do predate the era I want to focus on, and so I can't say that it's much of a 90s product. Still, like Medieval Times, which remember opened its first location in 1983, it not only thrived throughout the 90s, but was also a major influential force of the early 80s that then solidified this particular form of entertainment, in this case destination malls full of attractions, as something that went on to thrive throughout the 90s. In 1992, its most notable counterpart opened in Bloomington, Minnesota as the Mall of America, which was constructed by the owners of the West Edmonton Mall, the Germesian Brothers. While smaller than West Edmonton, the Mall of America was by far the largest mall in the United States and featured four lightly themed concourses that contained its roughly 400 stores. The North Gardens tried to feel like a landscaped park, East Broadway was themed to the street of the same name in New York City, South Avenue is described as a luxury hotel aesthetic, and finally, the West Market was designed to evoke the feeling of a European railway station through its decorative ironwork. When it opened, the mall was known for its eclectic collection of colorful retail and included a notable Lego playground for the Lego store. Featuring many dining locations, the mall was also notable for themed restaurant chains like Planet Hollywood or the Rainforest Cafe, which I've continued mentioning throughout the video but will have their own segment later. In terms of activities or entertainment outside of retail, the mall contained a 1.3 million gallon aquarium that opened as Underwater World in 1996, as well as a mini golf course known as Golf Mountain. The mall's first decade also saw venues such as a comedy club known as Knuckleheads, a small selection of night or dance clubs, and notably, even a small wedding chapel. However, the most notable entertainment venture in the mall was at its center with Knott's Camp Snoopy, which was designed and run by Knott's Berry Farm, although it was still owned by the mall. Knott's first licensed the Peanuts characters for Camp Snoopy in 1983 and brought the theme to the park here, which was not only a matter of trying to appeal to children, but also to Minnesota natives, as the creator of the Peanuts, Charles M. Schultz, was born in Minneapolis. The Peanuts theming mostly found its way into a few flat rides, such as a swing ride known as the Kite Eating Tree, but the rest were otherwise generically themed, with the Peanuts mostly present either through character meet and greets or the Snoopy figure that sat on top of the bounce house. The park also did open with one family coaster manufactured by Zerer, which was originally known as Pepsi Ripsaw. Visitors to the park would also notice its fake landscaping and rock work, which I think makes a lot of sense for building a park indoors especially when it can operate year-round, shielded from the Minnesota winter. It's obviously fake, but the emulation of being outdoors does a lot to make the park feel like a pleasant space, and was itself also a thematic callback to the western theme of Knott's Berry Farm. In fact, the park originally opened with a western-themed shooting arcade, and most notably, a remarkably well-themed log flume known as Paul Bunyan's Log Shoot. Themed after the famous American folk hero, the flume first brought riders through Paul's logging camp, before sending them up the first lift hill. Here, riders moved through the kitchen, featuring animatronic figures preparing a stack of pancakes, and a bottle of Knott's famous boysenberry pancake syrup could be seen nearby. Once they reached the top, the logs meander throughout the scenery, which is made up of rockwork, trees, and forest critters, while also providing great views of the park. From here, riders move into a log cabin structure which reveals another scene, where on the right, a bear is climbing a tree, and moving into the darkness, riders then find themselves falling down the first drop. The log then moves into another forested scene where riders witness Paul Bunyan himself, and climbing another lift hill, he warns them of the dangerous sawmill. Once they reach the top, a sawmill worker quickly stops the saw, and riders move outside again. They then approach the final drop, splashing down into the scenery below, 
and returning back to the load station. Not only was this ride really well themed for what we could expect from an indoor amusement park, but Camp Snoopy overall was a really well designed space that seemed like it knew its family audience pretty well. However, Knott's was acquired by Cedar Fair in 1997, which also included the licensing rights to the Peanuts, and while a few different versions of Camp Snoopy have come to other Cedar Fair parks since, the park in the Mall of America lost its Knott's and Peanuts branding after a falling out with Cedar Fair. In 2006, the park was rebranded briefly to The Park at Mall of America, as it worked to remove licensed references to Knott's and the Peanuts, and soon after, in 2008, through a licensing deal with Viacom that included rod replacements or rebranding, it officially reopened as Nickelodeon Universe. So, while not every mall in the 90s was defined by nostalgic postmodern aesthetics, in many places they certainly were. I think it's no coincidence either that the rise of the West Edmonton Mall in the 80s was perfectly timed for the rise of themed entertainment in the 90s, and the success of the Mall of America and Knott's Camp Snoopy are certainly proof of that. On the topic of themed malls, do you remember the forum at Caesars Palace from earlier in the video? Remember the canals of the Venetian, or the Desert Passage at the Aladdin? While they were certainly targeting a different audience than the malls we just spoke about, I did want to briefly bring them back up to reinforce the argument that themed mega malls thrived as products of the 90s. However, another connection I want to make is the popularity of indoor amusement parks with Fantasyland and Knott's Camp Snoopy, and Vegas actually introduced its own version in 1993. Connected to Circus Circus, Grand Slam Canyon was a small, 5-acre park enclosed by distinctive pink glass, and if you guessed from the name, was themed to the Grand Canyon, which was really just an excuse to put rock work in there. On opening, the park only contained a few attractions, including a raft slide, a shoot the chutes flume that ran to the top of the mountain, and an aero-produced coaster with two loops and two corkscrews, known as Canyon Blaster. The park also dotted eight different animatronic dinosaurs around the landscape, which guests could learn about from nearby plaques. It's a strange addition, but I guess you wouldn't forget seeing them, and Vegas was very much about novelty, after all. The park was initially quite popular, although the common complaint was that there was little to do, and it quickly added in some smaller activities and flat rides in 1994 to better attract a family audience. In 1997, the park was renamed to the Adventure Dome, which I do think is a better name, and it has continued to operate up through today, which stands in contrast with the short-lived MGM Grand Adventures that was located further south on the Strip. Before we get to that though, I need to provide a bit more context as to how the park came to be. In 1973, the MGM Grand opened as the newest resort on the Strip, and was owned by Kirk Kikorian, a notable real estate developer in Vegas at the time. It was named as such because of his acquisition of MGM, as in the movie studio, in 1969, and Kikorian also owned the land that Caesars Palace had been built on, which obviously stood out through its unique theme. The MGM branding for this particular resort would help it stand out as well, and while not really themed, was at least decorated luxuriously. However, a fire broke out in a downstairs deli in 1980, which spread smoke throughout the poorly ventilated hotel, leading to a severe 85 casualties mostly from inhaling smoke and carbon monoxide poisoning with no easy way to escape. While the resort did reopen with updated fire safety measures in 1981, the high cost of litigation against MGM led to Kikorian selling the resort to Bally Manufacturing in 1986, as he had already begun focusing on other business ventures instead. He shortly came back to the idea of another Vegas resort though, and development began on the new MGM Grand, which now opened on the south end of the Strip in December of 1993. The structure was absolutely massive, containing the largest gaming floor in the world at the time, as well as 5,000 rooms, most of which were located in its 30-story emerald glass towers. One of the resort's entrances also contained a giant lion structure that faced the Strip, which obviously drew a lot of eyes. In its original iteration, the MGM Grand was notable for its Wizard of Oz theming inside, with a massive display of Emerald City and the four main characters from the film posed in front, covered by a seven-story tall domed ceiling that had clouds projected onto it. 
The Emerald City also contained an attraction inside, and once tickets were bought, guests walked an immersive exhibit along the Yellow Brick Road through iconic locations in the film, encountering animatronic versions of the characters. Once they reached the end, they were led into a small theater where they experienced a 15-minute magic show known as The Wizard's Secret. Unfortunately, the resort renovated quickly in 1996, ripping out the show in favor of more slot machines, and the hotel went through a two-year process of removing all of the theming, which all resulted in substantially better revenue, to my disappointment. The lion itself was also demolished during this time, replaced with a large bronze lion statue instead, which is still impressive, but also somewhat less interesting than the original. Going back to the opening though, the resort also premiered a theme park, MGM Grand Adventures, right across the street. Themed to a faux movie studio, the park itself was tiny, taking up 33 acres, and you might be wondering, wait, how were they able to build this when Disney MGM Studios was already licensing the MGM name and films in their park? Initially, when the licensing deal was made in 1985, Disney was granted the right to use the MGM name and represent specific films for a relatively small, one-time fee, unbeknownst to Kokorian. When he did finally find out the year the park opened in 1989, he was reportedly furious with his executives and sued Disney on the grounds that they didn't disclose that the park would be a working studio and didn't want the MGM brand attached to production that wasn't their own. Disney then countersued, alleging that the Vegas park violated Disney's exclusive right to license the name, and that another park not run by Disney would harm their reputation, especially as it was seen as an extension of the casino. Ultimately, a judge ruled that both parties were allowed to use the name, although MGM could only use a stylized version of their logo, and their park couldn't be based around movies, which is why it ended up being so weird. When it opened, the entrance was themed as the Casablanca Plaza, which then led directly into New York Street. From there, parkgoers could spread out and experience the other themed lands which existed in a loop, and going clockwise, they were known as Old England Street, New Orleans Street, Tumbleweed Gulch, Salem Waterfront, French Street, and Asian Village. The park also opened with a handful of theater shows, but only seven rides. This included Parisian Taxis, a simple but themed bumper car ride on Paris Street, Lightning Bolt, an indoor coaster on New York Street that took riders through space, and the Haunted Mine, which seemed to be some sort of dark ride akin to a ghost train located on the Salem waterfront. Tumbleweed Gulch contained a log flume called Over the Edge, which was lightly themed to a sawmill, yet its other water companion, the Grand Canyon Rapids, which was located on New Orleans Street for whatever reason, was actually really well themed taking riders through many different buildings full of animatronics and various effects. Finally, Asian Village contained the entrance to some sort of tracked simulator hybrid known as Deep Earth Exploration, as well as the Backlot River Tour, which I would describe as the star attraction of the park. Riders would first board boats as they took a guided tour of this fake water set, first stopping in a swamp scene where a goofy knockoff of Universal's Gill Man would pop out of the water. The tour then moved on to a scale model of the Battle of Fort Sumter, the beginning of the American Civil War. Passing a few more movie props, the boat enters the Temple of Gloom, where some sort of statue of a vaguely South Pacific god is awakened, resulting in a volcanic eruption, which was really nothing more than water jets lit with red light. Emerging out, riders travel through the final scene known as Jungle Storm, themed as a set from the Vietnam War. From behind a rock facade, a helicopter hovers into view as a soldier shoots at a shack from a mountain turret. Meanwhile, Richard Wagner's Rod of the Valkyries blares from nearby speakers, trying to evoke the scene from Apocalypse Now. Before returning to the station, the boat travels past one last small scene, where the guide points out Patrick, one of the technicians responsible for the behind-the-scenes movie magic, although he is of course an animatronic himself. Returning to the park as a whole, you can certainly tell that MGM Grand Adventures was obligatory from the start, as Disney's countersuit destroyed any IP appeal that the park might have potentially leveraged. The movies and the River Tour were knockoffs dressed as parody, and even the park's lion mascot was known as King Louie, who was a weird knockoff of MGM's owned iconic Leo the Lion, which they seemingly couldn't use. As you can see, the park was also incredibly underbuilt, and it did soon add a few unthemed attractions here and there, but it was never successful, closing relatively soon in 2000. 
While many attractions came and went on the Vegas Strip in the 90s, I have yet to speak about the ambitious dinner show at Caesars Palace. Introduced in 1996, Caesars Magical Empire was an expensive, elaborate dining experience where patrons would first board a simulated ancient elevator and ascend underground into the catacombs under Caesars Palace. Once there, guests were escorted by a Roman soldier into one of ten themed dining rooms, or dining chambers of the gods, where they experienced a three-course meal and were entertained with magic tricks by a host sorcerer. Once the meal concluded, everyone was led out into the Sanctum Secorum, an elaborately themed ancient rotunda where a ritual is conducted by the ethereal voice of Caesar's greatest sorcerer. In this brief show that features a lot of pyro effects, he introduces the different worldly sorcerers gathered here by Caesar, highlighting the different themed portals that could lead anywhere, from ancient Egypt to the Far East. At its conclusion, guests then wandered into the different theaters over the course of the next two hours, experiencing different themed magic shows throughout. Finally wrapping up attractions of 90s Vegas though, I want to quickly head north to the Las Vegas Hilton, which opened the immersive Star Trek The Experience in 1998. After purchasing admission, visitors found themselves wandering the History of the Future Museum, filled with authentic props from the show and films. At its end, guests would then queue up to experience a simulator attraction. Once guided into a pre-show room, the riders would watch a brief safety video which flickered as the lights went out. Through a sound effect and cold air blown into the room, the lights returned and patrons found themselves in the transporter room of the Enterprise, achieved through the illusion of the previous walls having been lifted into the ceiling. Everyone is then greeted by one of the personnel of the starship, who leads them through a hallway and onto the bridge, a recreation of the actual set. Next, through a briefing, they learn that one of them must be an ancestor to Captain Picard, brought here to the future by Klingons through a time rift, subsequently erasing Picard from the timeline. At the conclusion of this segment, everyone is guided to a simulated lift, which malfunctions and shakes as Klingons begin to attack the Enterprise. Once guests reach the appropriate deck, they're sent into an airlock where they'll board a ship to defeat and escape the Klingons, which is where the actual simulator ride is located. Boarding, riders help to engage in a battle, and succeeding, they finally travel back in time to the present, passing by iconic Las Vegas landmarks to indicate their success, cleverly letting everyone out near where they were initially meant to board the simulator in the beginning. At the conclusion of the experience, guests then entered an area known as Deep Space Nine, filled with a few Star Trek themed gift shops, along with a dining option known as Quark's Bar and Restaurant, where they could dine among various alien species. While I've left out a lot of details for both this and Caesar's Magical Palace in the interest of time, and really because Expedition Theme Park has covered them in a lot more depth, I do think these are excellent, prominent examples of what the Vegas Strip had to offer. It wasn't just the themed hotels that rose in the 90s, but also the shows and experiences that came with them that really designated Vegas as a major destination of themed family entertainment. <laughs>